I'd like to present uh, the first speaker, uh, Annie Warburton. Uh, she is a host on ABC Radio. Uh, in the past, she's been a criminal lawyer, I believe, and a sometime actor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Annie Warburton. Thank you, Thank you Chris. That about sums it up. Where am I here? Now, I saw them bringing water. I know they've hidden it behind there somewhere. I must have water before I can start. <laughs> Pardon me, and please bear with me too, a little ladies and gentlemen. I'm in recovery from some kind of lurgy. Uh, now, we're going to start the morning with some interaction, a quiz, in fact. You all will have... Oh, good, here it is. This is, uh, this is my debut with any kind of... Is this PowerPoint? I think that's what they call PowerPoint, isn't it? Presentation, but my absolute outright debut. Right, now what we want from you is, um, these are all multiple choice questions as you see, there are 20 of them. We want from you a piece of paper with nothing indicated on it except your, as I say, your sex, or if you insist, your gender. Um, and two columns, one headed odds and one headed even, so that all the odd questions may, the answers to all the odd questions may be tallied, and likewise the answers to all the even questions. Now I'm sure you can all read No, you can't. All right, I'm going to read. Okay, going to start. Everyone got their pens and paper ready? Lot to get through here this morning, class. All ready? Good. Question one. What is the name of the natural child born to Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie? Is it A, Maddox, B, Suri, C, Shiloh, or D, Sean Preston? <laughs> you must have a guess. <laughs> Don't care. <laughs> oh, okay, yes. 200%? 200%. It's not moving. Yes? Yes, I'm up at the top here. It says 81% and I can't get it to move. Here you go. A bloke to the rescue, you see. <laughs> 200. <laughs> okay, bravo. See? Okay, got question one. You heard that anyway. Question two, a shadow board is usually found at A, a surf carnival, B, a seance, C, an architect's office. <gasps> Ooh. Ooh. Oh, heavens above. Sorry about that. Yes, I did too. For a minute I thought I... There's just one, one little slip there, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm pretty sure I don't have any of the other answers there. <laughs> Three, question three. The husband recently dumped by Britney Spears is A. Justin Timberlake, B. Ashton Kutcher or Kutcher, C. Kevin Federline or D. Brian McFadden. Question four. Not going too fast, am I? You've got it all written down there. To take a specky is A. To mark a football spectacularly, B. To buy a house off the plan. C, an expression used by a sniper, or D, to take a very good photograph. Okay. <laughs> Question five, who is the father of Demi Moore's children? <laughs> is it A, Bruce Willis, B, Ashton Kutcher, C, Alec Baldwin, or D, George Clooney? <laughs> Kind of reassuring cackle coming from you, Fred. Six, in, in sporting slang, a pie chucker is A, a left arm bowler bowling wrist spin, B, a poor bowler, C, a spectator who throws a pie at a player who has displeased him, or D, insider slang for a female shot putter. Question seven, Paul McCartney and Heather Mills had a child called Apple, Beatrice, Eugenie or Daisy? Question 
Question eight, a harmonic balancer is A, part of a car engine, B, sound mixing gear used in a recording studio, C, something used by the followers of Deepak Chopra, or D, a fancier version of a tuning fork, one used in orchestras. Question nine, Brooklyn, Romeo and Cruz are the children of Guy Ritchie and Madonna, David Beckham and Posh Spice, O.J. Simpson and the late Nicole Brown Simpson, or D, Leighton Hewitt and Beck Cartwright. Question 10, which of the following does a diesel engine not have? There may be more than one. A, carburetor, B, spark plugs, C, camshaft, D, valves. There is to be no collaboration. Did I mention that? Extremely important, especially no cross-gender, no transgender. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> 11. The natural child of Woody Allen and Mia Farrow is A. Dylan, B. Lark, C. Satchel, or D. Sunyi. In all but that one question about uh, diesel engines, there's only one correct answer. 12. Adjusting the shims would be done by A. A motor mechanic, B. A horse strapper, <laughs> C. A Scientologist, or D, a roof tiler. 13, Olivier Martinez is the boyfriend of A, Paris Hilton, B, Danny Minogue, C, Kylie Minogue, or D, Delta Goodrum. Question 14, bastard file is A, a file that won't, won't work properly, <laughs> B, a file with teeth that are midway between coarse and fine, C, the order in which base level army recruits march on graduation day, or T, a technical computer term for a document or file that gets lost. <laughs> 15, which of the following children of the late Paula Yates was not fathered by Bob Geldof? <laughs> A, was it Peach's Honey Blossom, B, Fifi Trixie Bell, C, Heavenly Hirani Tiger Lily, or D, Pixie? Question 16, Sicilian Defence, it's a term used in A, Judo, B, Mafiosi Trials, C, Chess, or D, Olympic Fencing? Question 17, Charlie and Tennyson are the children of, as you can see, Russell Crowe and Michelle Spencer, Brian Brown and Rachel Ward, Paul Hogan and Linda Kozlowski, or Kate Blanchett and Andrew Upton. Only three to go. A pom box, this is question 18, is, is a ship's boiler, a muffler, a slang term for the tiny cabins that were to be found on immigration, immigrant ships. Double check and double check that. Or a World War II ammunition container. 19. <clears throat> the adopted children of Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman are Rumor, Scout and Tallulah, David and Moses, Connor and Isabel, or Lourdes and Rocco. Actually, it doesn't really matter, ladies and gentlemen. The two times I've inadvertently given the answers here belong to the, I'm sure, what I'm sure you will have perceived by now to be the blokey questions, and I'm sure the women will do just as well as those. It's the chick questions which are going to sort you out. Finally, how many games did Australia play in the World Cup soccer finals in Germany? A, one, two, three, or four. There is no bonus, are no bonus points for being able to name the countries we played against. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is a quick tally, uh, arranged purely according to whether the question was in category A or category B, odds or evens, and... Um, We'll do a quick preliminary survey to see who got what right. And then I've got a glamorous assistant who's going to collect the answers. Hmm. When will we do the answers? Do you want to do the answers now? All right. Okay. What, what, that's right. No, that's right. You've got to swap, swap cards. Swap, swap with a neighbor. No cheating. 
Okay, the natural child of uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolly is Shiloh. That was, uh, sorry, C, number C, C, C. C, Shiloh. That question one, question one. The, na the name of the natural child born to Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolly was C. Shiloh. That was question one. That's all we've done, so. <laughs> question two. A shadow board is usually found in a garage. D, a garage. D, a garage. Question three. The husband recently dumped by Britney Spears is C, Kevin Federline. Question four, to take a specky is A, to mark a football spectacularly. Question five, the father of Demi Moore's children is A, Bruce Willis. Question six, in sporting slang, a pie chucker is B, a poor bowler. <clears throat> Question seven. The child of Paul McCartney and Heather Mills is B, Beatrice. Question eight. A harmonic balancer is A, part of a car engine. Question nine. Brooklyn, Romeo and Cruz are the children of David Beckham and Posh Spice. Question nine. That was question nine. B, 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 B. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Question 10. Uh, a diesel engine does not have either A, a carburetor, or B, spark plugs. So I am reliably informed. A and B. A and B is the correct answer. Um, half a one, Will? Half? Oh, the cry goes up, no halves. <laughs> Although, in this situation, I would have thought, no? You see? see he's a bloke. He's, he's absolutely ruthless and not prepared to be compassionate and nurturing and caring. <clears throat> okay, okay. <laughs> Question 11. The natural child of Woody Allen and Mia Farrow is... C. Satchel. Question 12. Adjusting the shims would be done by A. A motor mechanic. 13. Olivia Martinez is the boyfriend of C. Kylie Minogue. 14. Bastard file is usually, <laughs> officially, B. A file with teeth that are midway between coarse and fine. Question 15. The only child of the late Paula Yates not fathered by Bob Geldof was C, Heavenly Hirani Tiger Lily. Question 16, Sicilian defence is a term used in C, chess. 17, Charlie and Tennyson are the children of A, Russell Crowe and Michelle Spencer. 18, a pom box is B, a muffler. No. That's wrong, isn't it? A World War II ammunition container. Yes, beg your pardon. Yes, sorry. D, D, D. D. B. B. It's B. Okay, no, sorry. The person who set the question reckons it's B. You reckon? You sure? What should it be? How should it? Did you get the spelling wrong? <sighs> pom box, yeah, pom box, pom box, yeah, okay, muffler. B. There is only one correct answer. It's B. Sorry, that was a deliberate attempt to mislead you, that I had up there. At 19, the adopted children of Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman are C. Connor and Isabel. And 20, Australia played. Four games, four, D, four games in the World Cup soccer finals in Germany. Which is? D. D, 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 
D. Okay, now can I have, have you, have you sorted your answers, have you corrected and, and handed back to the person? Okay, all blokes, hands in the air. Okay, now if you did better, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> <laughs> All blokes who did better in the evens than they did in the odds, put your hand down. Yeah, see? Ha, ha, see? See? Point it proven. Hardly any blokes did better in the evens than in the odds, right? <laughs> okay, all the blokes who did better in the odds than in the evens, put your hands up. Yeah, yeah. QED, point proven. Well, there's a few blokes missing here. <laughs> okay, women, this will be interesting. Um, the women, all girls put their hands up, please. All women put hands up. All those who did better in the odds than in the evens, leave your hands up. Yeah, yeah, very few hands went down. Okay, okay, thank you. Sorry, ma'am? Degrees are three to one if you did turning one and nine in the other, or nine and oh, one in the other. Well, what I'll do then is I'll get to my glamorous assistant to collect the, the score sheets and we'll do a, a more serious analysis, possibly <laughs> even a meta analysis. If you got 19 right, you're a smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Enough of that. Now, I stand before you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning as an adult woman, but to paraphrase the one-time Speaker of the House of Representatives, Joan Childs, I no longer have sex in this position. I only have gender, female in my case. Sex has lost a meaning, gender has gained one. There was a time when to have sex meant both to belong to one of two sexes, and there were only two in those days and to engage in a spot of horizontal folk dancing. Nowadays, sex means only the latter, although it doesn't have to be performed exclusively horizontally, or so, once again, I'm reliably informed. Gender used to have a purely grammatical meaning, but now also covers the differences between men and women and all points in between. This state of affairs goes back to the 70s, when we Sheilas realised that we'd been given a raw deal over the centuries, and we set up a clamour for a fair ago. We sold the likes of Germaine Greer and other stroppy females onto you. And eventually you blokes, if you wanted a happy home life and a cuddle at night, came round to the idea that biology indeed was not destiny. We girls got equal pay for equal work. We no longer had to give up our jobs when we got married and we could study what we liked and have a go at anything, same as you blokes could. And I think we all agree that everyone is happier. And I'm talking, of course, here in, about in the, in the, the Western democracies or the Western-style democracies. <clears throat> I'm an unashamed fan of the Enlightenment and uh, universal values of individual liberty. liberty. I have no truck with cultural relativism, I'll say right from the outside. I say a culture that forbids a woman to feel sunshine on her face outdoors or that allows a brother to kill his sister if she takes a boyfriend he doesn't like is not as good as our own with all its faults, but then I always was an old-fashioned kind of girl. I'm also happy to admit that the fact that we women no longer have to wear out our lives and our health in endless impoverishing childbearing is down to medico-scientific advances made largely by men doing the post-enlightenment thing of exploring nature with the tools of reason and secular inquiry. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, step down off the soapbox for a moment there. What happened then, but just to skip over a few decades, was that it came to be believed, first in the halls of academe and then osmosing, if that's a word, outwards towards mainstream society, was that all the observable differences between men and women, except for the, the purely physiological ones, were down to nurture and that nothing was due to nature. Science is increasingly telling us that this isn't so, that the politics hasn't kept up with the science. Why this is so, who knows? Perhaps it's lingering nervousness over those centuries of persecution, but whatever the cause, the bathwater of biology as destiny has been thrown out, along with the baby of vive la différence. It's widely believed that if only we could properly socialise boys, that they wouldn't turn out to be the computer-hogging, sport-loving, 
birthday forgetting, sex obsessed, roughhouse, competitive, aggressive, girl baiting creatures we know them to be. And likewise, that if you didn't give girls dolls and expose them to fairy tales in which handsome and valiant princes were forever saving beautiful damsels in distress from dragons and such like, that they wouldn't grow up reading Mills and Boone novels and fashion magazines, remembering the names of celebrities' babies and dreaming of white weddings. And when all the kids grew up, it was fondly believed, you would get the theoretically ideal state of affairs where 50% of engineers and truck drivers and company CEOs were women and 50% of nurses and childcare workers and teachers would be men. This is the orthodoxy, that if the figures don't show absolute equality of outcomes, it's purely because we're not getting the nurturing right. And that's overwhelmingly what I've gleaned from years and years and years, more than I care to remember, of interviewing politicians and academics and social commentators. Now, the, this orthodoxy that maleness or femaleness is all a matter of nurture is enshrined in legislation in all states and territories in Australia. They've all in recent years adapted or adopted laws to recognise gender reassignment, whereby anyone who wants to switch from male to female or vice versa can simply fill out a form adopting a transgender identity. You don't have to have surgery or hormonal treatment, although many do. And voila, Bob's your auntie. And the language has followed. <clears throat> um, sex, with its biology's destiny implications, is out. Gender is in. Just the day I was writing this particular bit, I looked at um, a few newspapers and I saw that the GIO, for instance, calculates car insurance risk on, quote, make and age of vehicle, age and gender of owner drivers. The Nova radio station chain claims to provide an eclectic mix of music which caters for no particular age or gender. The new Speedo uh, bathing suits, or cozies for you Sydney siders, are specific for different strokes as well as gender. And elsewhere I found discussion of the gender pay gap, gender issues, gender relations, gender equality, gender imbalance, gender impact statements and gender discrimination. Although, curiously, we still have a Sex Discrimination Act. But who can doubt that if, if this act were passed or initiated today, Prue Goward would be the Gender Discrimination Commissioner? <coughs> Purely an accident of the timing, I submit. Even the Prime Minister, a noted social conservative, has succumbed. Last March, announcing a proposal to amend the Sex Discrimination Act, he said it would allow the Catholic Church to offer gender-specific scholarships to encourage men into teaching. So that leaves sex, ladies and gentlemen, to include all sexual behaviour, except in the mind of Bill Clinton. <laughs> well, it doesn't include all sexual behaviour, obviously, does it? And, uh, of course, it still applies to animals, although, so help me, I have heard ABC sports re reporters refer to the gender of racehorses. The interesting question is, how far do observable differences in sexual makeup affect our behaviour and capacities? Although not at Harvard University, it seems, where it's a banned question, where President Lawrence Summers was howled down for simply suggesting that there might be innate reasons why there are not so many women in the hard sciences. Well, now I have a, here an excellent disquisition. Um, on just this very subject, the latest sciences. Uh, much of it is um, down to the work of Dr. Simon Baron Cohen of uh, Cambridge University, long-suffering cousin of Sasha, <laughs> and who, he, he to whom the media always goes because his cousin Sasha being such a, a notoriously private person in private, never answers the phone, especially on Saturdays, to talk about his creation Borat. Anyway, I digress. Um, he, and he says, just, just to summarise a few, I'm sure most, many of you will be familiar with much of this material, behavioural differences appear early. For example, a one-day-old girl will look for longer at a face than a mechanical mobile. A boy will prefer the mobile. Um, Dr Baron Cohen and associates have tested this. It's, um, it seems to have a direct correlation to amount of testosterone exposure in the womb. Boys exposed to relatively high levels looked less often at their mother's faces, made eye contact less frequently, and had smaller vocabularies than those exposed to lower levels. 
Furthermore, within a year of birth, boys and girls also prefer different toys. Boys prefer cars, trucks, balls and guns. Girls prefer, prefer dolls and tea sets. Although evolution has clearly not had the opportunity to mould a preference for tea sets, I'm reading here because I think this is very well put, there is evidence from another species which suggests that human infants might be predisposed to prefer toys that have particular adaptive significance to their sex. And uh, there's a reference here to research done at uh, London University and also in Texas involving vervet monkeys where the males spent more time with the boy toys and the females with the dolls. Now, says, uh, says Simon Baron Cohen, obviously cu cultural stereotyping is an improbable explanation for this. And so the theory remains that the toys preferred by young females are objects that offer opportunities for expressing nurturing behaviour. Uh, and um, likewise, young males, whether simian or human, prefer toys that can be used actively or propelled in space and which afford greater opportunities for rough play. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, for me, this has been borne out by countless stories related by young parents, even the most progressive and determinately non-sexist of them, such as my friends Andy and Bev, whose example will suffice here for all the others. They had two little girls and a boy. Uh, they were absolutely t determined. No pink and blue distinctions for the kids. Uh, no guns for Michael. He wasn't allowed to have any toys, noisy, loud toys, anything like that. I went with them. I happened to be visiting them when she took the kids to choose their Christmas presents. The first stop was a dance goods shop where the frilly tutus and the gauze wings and the sparkly tiaras that the little girls had asked for were to be found. It didn't take long for Michael to get this troubled look on his face. He was four years old. <laughs> this look of deep suspicion crept into his eyes and he, after a while, he figured it out and he shouted, This is a fairy shop! I want a truck! <laughs> then there was the time my mother gave my little niece a toy vacuum cleaner for Christmas. My mother's a real reactionary in this area, I have to say. And it was promptly seized on and hogged by her older brother, my nephew. Ah, that disproves your theory, I can hear you object. But the point is that the vacuum cleaner was a machine which made a noise and was therefore irresistible to a little boy. Need I add that my nephew grew up to be an extremely blokey teenager, as defined by all the well-known criteria, including sister baiting, monosyllabic communication, and aversion to family gatherings. <laughs> Incidentally, this notion anyway that we're still socialling the children the wrong way just doesn't bear up. When did you last see a children's book in which the girls were portrayed as pink and fluffy and helpless? Can you imagine the public lynching of the author that would take place if they did? In fact, I read just earlier this week that a new version of Winnie the Pooh is about to be published with a girl entering the story. Needless to say, she is described as an adventurous, spirited tomboy. And rightly so. I'm not complaining about that. Now, this right here, back to this um, summary of all the differences, has looked at all the latest research and the analyses and the, and the meta-analyses and all the common about all the, the common suppositions, such as that men are better at maths and engineering and spatial tasks and ball sports and war, and that women are more verbal and caring and peaceful. And it finds grains of truth in all these, a lot of overlap, but not a huge, lot of huge differences. It says, though, for instance, um, yeah, girls and boys are equally good at maths prior to puberty. Males and females of any age are equally good at computation and at understanding mathematical concepts. However, after their mid-teens, men are better at problem solving than women are. Males also have better spatial abilities than females. If asked to imagine rotating a three-dimensional object, a skill useful in engineering, the difference is quite large. However, contrary to popular myth, men and women are equally good at navigating. <laughs> but, so there! But the sexes take different paths to the same destination. Women tend to rely on remembering landmarks, whereas men rely on their geometric skills to work out direction and distance. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, it goes on to, just to summarise, because I think this stuff is fascinating, that, that there's this business about men being at the extremes, that um, uh, there's not much difference in the, in the averages. But, and while average IQ is about the same, there are more idiots and prodigies amongst the men. <laughs> while the women, the females, tend to cluster around the, the middle. Now, as for the... Speaking of um, 
uh, men, the, the book, you know, why men, how does it go? Why men don't listen, no, no, not that one. Uh, why men don't listen and women to can't read maps, that's right. There is actually a new one out which was extracted in the bulletin just very recently, just a few weeks ago, by a woman called Dr. Marianne Legato, professor of clinical medicine at Columbia University in New York, called Why Men Never Remember and Women Never Forget. Um, <laughs> and the heading for this very interesting discussion on it in the bulletin is, um, expands on that. Men never listen and never remember while women never forget and never shut up. <laughs> anyway, Dr. Legato posits... that it's all down to oestrogen. She says, because oestrogen means that women remember stressful events better than men. Because oestrogen not only activates a larger field of neurons in women during an upsetting experience, meaning that they experience the stress more intensely, but it also prolongs the amount of time that the adrenal gland, gland secretes the stress hormone cortisol, which happens to be a natural memory booster. She goes on to say, researchers speculate that there is an evolutionary basis for this. If women are the primary caregivers of their young, then it is incumbent on them to remember potentially dangerous situations, such as which plants are poisonous and which watering spots are already spoken for by animals with large teeth. Men have no such facility for a similar evolutionary reason. If a man has perfect recall of how scared he felt during the last mammoth hunt, he'd be far less enthusiastic about going out this time, <laughs> which is not what you want when dinner depends on his fearlessness. Interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Ah, yes, but see, we were never given any choice, were we? <laughs> she, uh, she tells a story, too, an interesting story. I like this. It might ring bells. About a patient of hers. Remember, this woman's a, a clinical, um, a clinical physician, a professor of clinical medicine at Columbia. She's now lightweight. Story about a patient of hers who took a holiday with her longtime boyfriend. They spent most of their time discussing some of the major issues in their relationship. At the end of the trip, she told him that she thought they'd learnt a lot and thought it improved her understanding of what was going wrong and right between them. He, on the other hand, told her he'd hated the hours they'd spent on the subject and had found the whole exercise pointless and even destructive. Perhaps, says Dr. Legato, their conflicting memories of the holiday had something to do with their memories of the events. My patient could have mapped out a flow chart of issues raised, solutions proposed, and resolutions adopted even months later. Her boyfriend, on the other hand, was considerably fuzzier on the specifics even hours afterwards, and soon after stepping off the plane, he remembered only arguing. <laughs> I think that's absolutely perfect. <laughs> and there's yet more evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that when you look at the observable differences between male and female behavior, you can explain them in sociobiological or, or psychoevolutionary terms. And inspired by Dr. Legato, that's, this is my mission hereafter for what remains of my time, um, to claim back for nature some of the ground that it's lost to nurture and to say that sex is indeed better than gender any day. Now, some years ago, Austria proposed to pass a law to make men do their share of housework. I said back then, and I'll say it again, this was a futile exercise. It ignores the nature of the beast. My advice to the Austrians and to any other government contemplating the folly of such a law was, forget it. I mean, how are you going to enforce it? Say the uh, female-gendered partner calls up the police in angry tears to report her male partner for not doing the dishes. Say the cops come, but by the time they arrive, he's elbow deep in hot, soapy water, and she's refusing to press charges. The cops will develop a deep cynicism about going to a domestic and you'll never get them around in a serious case, such as when he refuses to take out the garbage. <laughs> and what if he doesn't cop a plea? It's all very well to lay a charge that on or about the evening of the fourth day of March, you did willfully, knowingly omit, neglect, or fail to clean out the toilet in breach of section 456, subsection C of the Housework Act 1996. But shouldn't there be a statutory defense or two, such as that he was the one who had to change the tire in his penguin suit, the time they got a flat on their way to his sister's wedding? Well, can't you just imagine the clogging up of the courts as thousands of cases like this come before them? 
And what if he says he doesn't mind having a spattered toilet bowl or a grimy shower recess, can't see the point of ironing and doesn't expect her to do it either? How are you going to solve a jurisprudential conundrum like that? This gentleman's walking towards me. <laughs> I think I've got... How long have I got? I'm over time already. Yeah, well, I was going to... Okay, I can, I can wind up there. You'll, you'll be deprived of my... Uh, um, uh, what I was going to do here after, ladies and gentlemen, was in, in the interest of easing budgetary pressures on governments the world over, set out a list of significant differences between men and women against it, which it would be pointless to legislate. But what I'll do instead... Crikey, I, I did badly estimate, didn't I? Um, yes, look, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude then. Oh, actually, no, what I will do, just quickly, if I may, and be naughty here for one minute. I went searching on the internet. You've probably seen this. I think there's more truth. <laughs> Since time has got away from me, ladies and gentlemen, I'll say that really this diagram says it all, sums it up. But I will conclude. I will conclude with this gem, which was sent to a new scientist by one of its readers, who spotted it in an article about gender in a Swedish publication called Folkvet. It goes as follows. The argument that there exists a difference between the sexes is a typically male point of view. <laughs>